This lesson is on retinal detachment. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about the risk factors and the causes and the pathophysiology behind retinal detachment. We're also going to talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So retinal detachment is an ophthalmological condition or an eye condition involving tearing or separation of the retina. So there's going to be some slight differences as to the pathophysiology behind why there is detachment of the retina. We're going to talk about that in the next upcoming slides. So the retina is the light sensitive layer of tissue located in the posterior of the eye. So if we look in this image here, it's at the back of the eye. And this is the light sensitive layer of cells, which includes the rods and cones that allows for vision. There are actually three types of retinal detachment. One type is known as regmatogenous. Another type is known as tractional. And another type is known as exudative. We're going to talk about these in more detail in the next upcoming slides. Now, how many people are affected by retinal detachment? It's estimated to affect 6 to 18 per 100,000 per year. And there are different incidences of different types of retinal detachment in different populations. There is a higher incidence of regmatogenous retinal detachment in Southeast Asians, for instance. So there is some differences with regards to different populations. Let's talk about the pathophysiology behind retinal detachment. We're first going to have to look at the three different types. Each type has a different pathophysiology. The first, again, is regmatogenous. This is actually going to be the most common type of retinal detachment. This involves a rip or tear leading to a break or hole in the retina. So there's a ripping or tearing of the retina. This rip or tear in the retina allows the vitreous humor, which is the clear gel-like fluid that essentially fills the space of the eyeball, it allows that vitreous humor to flow through the disruption, gets underneath the retina, and essentially allows the retina to pull away and separate from the other underlying layers. Now, the second type is tractional. Tractional is not caused by a tear or disruption of the retinal layer. It's caused by something else. It is due to the retina pulling away from the underlying layers. So it's not about a hole or a rip in the retina. It's actually about the retina being pulled away from the underlying layers. And you might be wondering how that happens. Well, sometimes there may be some structure within the vitreous humor that will stick to the retina and essentially pull it. And then there is exudative. Exudative is actually caused by an underlying inflammatory process. It's inflammation underneath the retina, and that inflammation leads to swelling and essentially allows the retina to be pulled away from the underlying layers. So it's another way for the retina to pull away without it being torn or disrupted. And this inflammatory process can be due to a tumor or a lesion. Now that we know those three different types and the pathophysiology behind those types, let's talk about the risk factors. Now, each of the different types has different risk factors. With regards to regmatogenous, the following risk factors are important. Trauma. So you can imagine that if the eye is struck or if there's some trauma to the eye, this could essentially lead to a rip or disruption of the retina. This could cause a retinal detachment. A family history. So if there is previous family histories of retinal detachment, you're more likely to also have it as well, especially if there is first degree relatives that have had a retinal detachment. If you've had a history of retinal detachment, for instance, if you had a retinal detachment in one eye, you're more likely to also have it happen in the other eye. If you've had previous eye surgeries, especially intraocular surgeries, and this essentially could lead to an injury of the retina causing a tear or a rip. Pathologic myopia or pathologic nearsightedness, this could also be a risk factor as well. There are some other risk factors here too that are more specific to anatomical irregularities within the eye. These include a lattice degeneration, meridional folds, enclosed orbes, peripheral retinal excavations, and then the other ophthalmological condition, posterior vitreous detachment. With regards to tractional types of retinal detachment, again, trauma is a risk factor, but we can also see retinal vein occlusion, retinopathy of prematurity, which can occur in newborns, sickle cell trait or anemia. So if there is sickle cell disease, this could lead to issues with tractional retinal detachment, diabetic retinopathy, and proliferative vitreoretinopathy. So all of these can play a role in tractional retinal detachment. And then with regards to exudative, exudative are going to be 
things that lead to some inflammatory process underneath the retina. These include ocular cancers, metastases in the eye, so non-ocular or extraocular cancers that have metastases to the eye. These could lead to inflammatory processes within the eye underneath the retina, causing separation. Some infections, syphilis, tuberculosis, and toxoplasmosis can also lead to inflammation and increase the risk for exudative retinal detachment. Sarcoidosis is another cause. Corticosteroid use is another cause. Hypertension and CRVO, which is central retinal vein occlusion. So these are all possible causes of exudative retinal detachment. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of a retinal detachment. Oftentimes these signs and symptoms are going to be sudden. There's going to be sudden onset. Some of these symptoms include the following, flashes of light or photopsia. So you can imagine that the light sensitive layer, the retina, if it's being pulled away from the underlying layers, it's going to lead to sensations of flashes of light because you're essentially activating some of those cells by that separation, that trauma. Floaters can also be something that can be found, especially in regmatogenous. And these floaters are going to occur because there's going to be damage to the retina. So there's going to be pieces of the retina floating around in the vitreous humor, and the patient's going to see those as floaters. There's going to be many floaters. It's not going to be just a few. So they're going to have a sudden onset of many, many floaters and flashes of light. There can also be visual field losses because the retina is required for vision. If there's damage to the retina, you can lose parts of your vision. This can be either peripheral or central vision. And these visual field losses can be fixed or progressive, so can be stable or can continue to worsen over time. And then patients may also have what we call a relative afferent pupillary defect. So if you want more information on this, please refer to other sources on this clinical finding. There can also be visual disturbances. They may have bleeding from torn retinal vessels, so this can lead to visual disturbances. It can appear to the patient to be a moving haze, so due to that bleeding within the eye, and then ultimately can also lead to blindness as well. How is retinal detachment diagnosed? So oftentimes, a clinician is going to do a slit lamp examination of the anterior chamber of the eye, and what can be noted is Schaffer's or Schaffer's sign. And what a Schaffer sign is, is it is clumping of pigmented cells. So parts of the retina essentially get clumped and can be seen in the anterior chamber. And it's also important to do a dilated fundoscopic examination as well. POCUS or point of care ultrasound can also be used and optical coherence tomography can also be used. And then some other findings can include decreased intraocular pressure. So this is in comparison to the non-affected eye. So there's decreased intraocular pressure in the affected eye in the eye that is having the retinal detachment compared to the normal eye. So that is another finding as well. So how do clinicians treat retinal detachment? Oftentimes laser therapy or cryotherapy can be used for breaks or tears, especially before a full-blown retinal detachment occurs. So if there is any tears or breaks noticed in the retina, these can be closed over with laser therapy. With regards to rigmatogenous retinal detachment, retinal surgery is often required. There is a procedure known as the scleral buckle procedure. So scleral buckle procedure is where a silicone band is stitched on the outside of the eye, so it's stitched onto the sclera of the eye, the white of the eye, this essentially squeezes the eye. So it is a method of attempting to prevent the separation of the retina from the other underlying layers. There's also pars plana vitrectomy and pneumatic retinopexy where there is air pumped into the eye. This is usually used for a single lesion retinal detachment. And again, this is intraocular gas that is put inside of the eye. With regards to tractional cases, the vitrectomy can also be used to remove causes of the traction. And with regards to exudative cases, it's important to treat the cause of the inflammation. So treating the underlying cause is important with regards to exudative retinal detachment. If you want to learn more about other ophthalmological conditions, please check my ophthalmology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.